this morning listening online and now watching online on our YouTube channel, thanks to the amazing stage crew that we have up in the back. And everybody here in the auditorium to the kickoff of our new series, Love and Marriage. Love and Marriage. All right, wait. I think it's coming. All right? No? I hear a song coming on. I do. Oh, there you go. All right, now, going to keep that playing lightly in the background as I, as I keep talking for a little bit. Now, this series is going to be very good for everybody because if you're not married, then there might be a potential that one day you are, if you're a teenager, you might get married in the future. And so it's good to know, right, what the biblical perspective of marriage is, right? Or if you're newly married, it's great because now you can continue to build on a strong foundation for what a biblical marriage is. Or if you've been married a really long time, right, then this would be good to kind of infuse some fresh perspective in life into your, your marriage or um, potentially you're sing, you know, your single parent as well. And you, you never know what the future holds and so this will be a good message for everyone. And the reason why we're taking four whole weeks on marriage is because, you know, marriage matters and marriage is important. And we, we believe in it so much, you know, and that we will take four weeks off, I mean four weeks specifically for marriage, we, we're doing a reconnect marriage retreat, you know, and this isn't a, a condemnatory statement, but, you know, if 50% of marriages, both Christian and non-Christian, are ending in, 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 ending in divorce, then that means we're not doing marriage well. Go together like a okay? And, 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 and I want to do this series because I know, because statistically, you know, many, most people in the congregation may have already been divorced before, that it's easy to shy away from the heart of God and the plan of God because of circumstances. But it's my job to challenge you and to teach you God's plan for marriage. And that's not condemnation. It's just we want you to succeed in marriage. Whether this is your first time in marriage or this is your second or third marriage, we want this marriage that you're in to succeed and we want it to be healthy, we want it to grow. And so that's why we're doing this series. And I'm not pretending this month to be a marriage expert, okay? I'm not, you know, doctor whoever <laughs> you would see on TV. I have a lot of room in my own life to grow as a husband and to be the husband that God called me to be. I'm not pretending to have it all together, so I'm just going to get that out of the way right off the bat and let you know that. So for part one this morning, we're going to talk about what is marriage supposed to be, right? What's it supposed to look like? And then uh, next week, we're going to talk about, of course, how to have good sex, and you're going to invite your friends for that. And then uh, for part three, J.P. Dorsey, who's the speaker of our marriage retreat, he's going to come and do a message I'm really excited for called, How Do You Get to the Point to Celebrate Your 50-Year Wedding Anniversary? Right? How, do you, how do you get to that point? It's going to be really cool. And then we're going to end the series with a, a message called Fight Fair, all right, fight fair. How to have healthy conflict in your marriage. And it's going to be a lot of fun. And, there, and marriage has been a very hot topic over the last couple of years, you know, in our culture. It's like, you know, what is marriage supposed to look like? You know, can it be defined? What is it, how is it supposed to, to be? Because if we're honest, most of us haven't seen the best role model or example around us when it comes to marriage. Now, there's this movie called Juno, and Juno was a 16-year-old girl. This is years ago. And she had this boyfriend, and his name was Polly. And first they were friends, and then they, and then they, then they had a, a baby together, and then they started dating and going out. And then there's a part at the end of the movie where she asks her father a very powerful question. And she says, she says, Dad, I'm starting to lose my faith in humanity. And then she says, is it possible that two people can be in love forever? And I think that's a pretty powerful question. You know, what she was saying is she's looking at her relationship with her dad and her mom. She's looking at her relationship with her friends around her. She's looking at the marriages and the culture. And she's thinking, is it possible that two people can, can fall in love and stay in love and married forever? Is that possible? You know, and I think there's something inside of us that goes, we want that kind of marriage relationship. I mean, we want that to happen. And in spite of, in spite of your personal experience, I believe that there's a glimmer of hope inside of you that says, you know, I want that for me. I want my marriage to make it. 
And see, it's interesting, though, because never before in the history of mankind, I believe, has it been easier to fall in love and get married, right? Because you can go to Las Vegas to get married. You can go to your mayor in any city and get married to city council, right? You could go ahead and have a friend go online to universalchurch.com and get ordained in a matter of a week and have a, and have a license to marry you in your backyard, right? It's never been easier to, to get married. It's never been easier to fall in love. Did you know there's 1,500 websites that will help, for a small fee, help, you know, take your profile and pair you with somebody else so you can find, you know, and fall in love. So it's never been easier to fall in love and get married, but it's never been harder to stay in love and to stay married. And that's the goal. To stay in love. Is it possible? And I believe that, that the reason why we still believe it is, is there's this, there's this, this it's a kind of the, a little bit of the image of God in you and in me. It's a, it's a hint of the stamp of God going, no, this is what my plan is. This is my design. You know, and we think, you know, okay, Jeremy, that's all nice that God's plan is for us to stay married, but it, it's, you know, it's possible, but it's probably not probable, Right? Most of us think, Jeremy, it's possible, but it's probably not, not probable because we look around us at, at the culture and statistics and our own experience and we're thinking, man, it just doesn't look very hopeful. It doesn't look very promising. So my question to you this morning is this, have you ever wondered why, why marriages, 50% are failing in our country? Have you ever thought long enough to ask the question, Why? Maybe have we been taught the wrong definition of marriage, right? If it's not working, then maybe something's broken, right? Maybe we've been taught something wrong. Maybe we're missing something. So if we're missing something, and if it's not working, why not open up our hearts to maybe the, the creator of the universe and the plan that he has written for us. That's why I'm so thankful for the ancient book that we call the Bible that gives us a clear plan for marriage, a design for marriage, a blueprint for marriage. Even though it's not easy, it's clearly defined for us. And so I'm excited for this series. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Now if you're not familiar with the Bible, the Bible is two sections, Old Testament and New Testament. Ephesians is the 10th book of the New Testament. We're going to look at verse 1. Now the verses will be on the screen. You can follow along there. I um, encourage you, we encourage everyone, if you have any kind of device, download the free app called YouVersion. Or if you have, if you have the, uh, the actual old school Bible, there's actually paper. You know, go ahead and, and look at the index and you can find Ephesians in the New Testament. And we're going to look this morning at the, at the definition of marriage. And the reason why we're going to look at the definition of marriage is because our theological understanding of marriage matters because it determines our actions. So if we don't have the correct theology of marriage, then our actions will not line up with that and it won't be the plan of God. And so our theology and our theological understanding of marriage matters because it impacts how we behave. And so every week at One at Family Church, we have a slogan. And this one's a really short one, but powerful one. And I'm going to try to unpack this throughout the message this morning. So if you can repeat this with me this morning. If you can say, marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Now, that, now you sounded like you're, you're signing a contract. So why don't we talk about, like we're, we're making a covenant. Say, marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Awesome, awesome. Now before we get into, um, you know, the Bible this morning, you know, I have a question for you. What if we had, for just a week, put a hidden camera in your living room and recorded the conversations between you and your spouse? <laughs> you know, and then for the, for the following month of the series, we would play little clips of it throughout, throughout the, the message. I, you know, I wonder what it would look like. I think it may, it may look, may, just a little bit, little bit like this. I want you to check this out. Let's give them a round of applause. Honey, I'm home. Hey, hey, how's it going? You're early. That's the third, third time this week. I know, you might want to write that down. I know, I will, I will. How was your day? Hey, you know that proposal I've been working all week for uh, Rich and Nick? Uh-huh. 
I gave it to them today and they just poo pooed the whole thing. Oh. Yeah, and then I went to go write it down and I realized that's the third time this week that they've been so negative, so they're kind of slipping. Yeah, you know what? I know how you feel because my mom, she's got three pages of negatives really? already. I don't even know how to tell her. Oh, I'll tell her. That's okay. <laughs> this smells good. What's for dinner? Lasagna. Ooh, my favorite. I'll go ahead and write that down. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, look at that. That's 10 pluses in a row this week for you. I've been trying. Yeah, that's quite a turnaround from last week. What do you mean? Well, you know, that shopping spree was a bit much. It was not. We talked about that and you said it was fine. Yeah, okay. Well, proof is in the ledger, so. <laughs> I did make peach cobbler for dessert. You plan on doing any more shopping? No. Okay, that's one point. Hey, that's at least two points. What do you mean two points? One point for the peaches and one point for the crust. Store-bought crust? No. Frozen peaches? Mm-mm. All right, I'll write it down. Two, two points. points. <laughs> so, where are the kids at? Oh, Dylan, he's off with Jacob somewhere. Audrey's at gymnastics. Riley's over in her playpen. Yeah. Jackson is in his room. I thought Jackson had karate tonight. He did, but he decided he'd rather poop on the floor three times. And he got into Audrey's Shopkins, flushed them all down the toilet. You know what he called it? Pool, Pool party. party. Nice. Yeah, so he's, he's really, really low on points. He's going to sit in his room and he's going to think about it. The kid's got issues. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Evan called. Yeah. He needs um, to borrow the chainsaw again. Oh, are you talking about Evan Destad? Yes. Last time I let him touch it, we had to replace the entire fence in the backyard. You said it was okay. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't mean that. Well, you know, it can stay on the ledger for a little bit. It's not a big deal. Yeah, that's true. Then he owes me. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Here, hmm. this is for you. What's this? It's a receipt. I had to go out and buy a gift for Annette. Really? For what? Well, you know, I, I ordered some jewelry and then she showed up with all this extra free jewelry for no reason at all. No she just reason said, at all. that's for being a good friend. Here you go. Were you down one or something? Not by what I can see. I wasn't. That's crazy. Yeah, so I had to go out and buy her some flowers. Yeah. You know, keep it even. Oh, that's why you were tossing and turning so much last night. Yeah. Yeah. You kept me up long enough to lose a few points, actually. You <laughs> better not have. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. All right. <laughs> so when's dinner going to be done? Um, probably like 30 minutes. Okay, good. I got some time to start scouting for my fantasy draft next year. You can never be too sure. No, you don't get points for fantasy football. Yeah, no, I get it, but I like it. Yeah, but you'd get points if you went for a run. Yeah, but I don't like running. Did you do your Pilates this morning? No. Mm -hmm. Back to fantasy football. <laughs> well, I did take Audrey to gymnastics. Uh, but do I really need the points? Badly. What do you mean badly? How badly? Let's just say you're making Jackson look good. Oh, I didn't poop on the floor. Not this and I time. came home early three times this week. Yeah, but you were late four times last week. Well, yeah, but I've had to pick up extra gigs lately to bring money in. What do you mean by that? Well, I, you know, it's, it's no big deal, but ever since you stopped working full time, I've had to go out oh, and pick up some side since jobs. Since you know? I stopped working, that was an agreed upon decision by the both of us. Did you take points away? Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. I cannot stand you. Oh, that's minus 10 points. No, 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 no. I said can't stand. I didn't say hate. Yeah, it's yeah, different. but yeah, I know what you meant, and you know what you it meant, too. It doesn't matter what you mean. It matters what you say. Oh, really? So for every compliment, I get two points. Okay, let me get this straight. You know, honey, your hair looks beautiful today. You know that? That's two points. And you look great in those jeans, honey. That's two points. And to be honest, you've only nagged me half as much as last week. So that's, that's six points right there. Now, I'll tell you what, I am earning these points the old-fashioned way. You're not being fair. Fair? Fair, okay. You know what? I spend half of my life indebted to you, working a million hours a week to get us out of the red. I really don't have any time for being fair. Jeff, this is the only way we can keep things fair between us.
Now, we may not say exactly like that. You know, we call them the ledger people, right? But we often, you know, live this way. You know, we'll say, I'll serve my spouse as long as they uh, make sure they appreciate me the right way, right? Or I will give the extra mile as long as they're going to acknowledge it and give the extra mile back to me. You know, it kind of makes marriage more like, like a contract, right? And if you ever had a contract before, what's a contract? Well, the definition of a contract is simply a, a agreed upon terms between two parties. When one party doesn't hold up their end of the contract, it's considered a breach of contract. And the contract is null and void. And, there, and the reality is there are tons of marriages that are walking around with a contract. And it's super long. And they're keeping the ledger and they're keeping score and they're trying to keep things right fair. But the reality is that the more and more that you walk around, you know, keeping score, then the more resentment, the more anger, the more bitterness, and the harder your heart begins to grow and love begins to, to fade away. And it's this vicious cycle that begins to take place because marriage was never meant to be a contract. It was meant to be a covenant. And the amazing thing is when we, when we treat marriage like a contract and we keep score and seeing who, who's doing what, we, it never works, does it? It never is profitable, is it? it it's not rewarding and, and who really wins? I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, for some, you know, we haven't seen healthy marriage relationships modeled in front of us and so we do what we've learned, which is model unhealth. You know, and, and we kind of had this stuff modeled for us, and maybe you can relate to this. Do unto others the way they deserve. Do unto others as they do unto you. Do unto others as the mood would have it for the day. Do unto others as long as they th see things your way. Do unto others until you wear them down and they agree to your demands. Or do unto others until you're ready to leave. This is what we see all around us. And, and if that's not enough with marriage, high expectations from our spouses and a long list of personal needs and the low tolerance for disappointment, super quick willingness to run from problems instead of dealing with them, no wonder why the odds seem so stacked against us that how in the world can marriage really make it for the long haul. But if we have the right theological understanding of marriage, I believe we can begin to change. Because marriage is meant to be a covenant, not a contract. And so Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, where we start off this morning, says this in Ephesians chapter 5. Imitate God, therefore, in what? Yeah, you're like, I'm not saying it. Mm -mm, no way. One more time. Imitate God in everything. everything you do. Because you are his dear children. Now, I know that's an awful big statement to come out of the gate with, you know. He's opening chapter 5, you know, with, with swinging some big, big punches here. He's saying, imitate God in everything you do. That, that's, that's not a small order. That, that's, that's a big task, right? Is, is Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God, right? And he, what did he do? He, he came to us in love. Well, what did he do in love? Well, the next verse tells us. In verse 2, it says, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. That he loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us. A pleasing aroma to God. See, we're called to live a life of love, following the example of Jesus. And what example did Jesus give? He simply offered his life as a sacrifice. Now he made, listen to this, this is so powerful. And if, you, if you're taking notes on the back of your communicator or on your tablet, whatever, write this down. Is Jesus made a conscious choice, listen to this. Jesus made a conscious choice and a decision that he was going to love us regardless of how we responded. Jesus Christ made a conscious choice that he was going to love you, he was going to love me regardless of how we responded. He was going to give himself to us even if we didn't give ourselves to him. He was, gonna, he was gonna be more concerned with pleasing his heavenly father than pleasing us. And so he came as a sacrifice out of love. Marriage is more of a covenant than a contract. And I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, wait a minute, Jeremy. Wait a minute, that doesn't sound American. <laughs> you're right, it's not. It's called the kingdom of God. 
It goes against our culture. It goes against everything that we see. It goes against what, what's been modeled in front of us. It goes against how we feel sometimes in the heat of the moment. But if we're really all in with God and we want to follow his path and his plans and we really want our marriage to succeed, then we have to find ourselves committing to this thing that God calls a covenant, not a contract. Because marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Ephesians 5.21 goes on to even explain it further in the chapter, which is pretty powerful. And I love this chapter because it talks about laying, how Jesus Christ laid his life down as a sacrifice and we're called to do the same. And do you know what happens when you're a sacrifice? It's painful. <laughs> right? Nobody just says, hey, I want to be a sacrifice. I'm going to take my wants and my desires and my plans. I'm going to love you regardless of how you treat me. That's not like, woo, that's a great day, right? It's, it's hard. But Jesus Christ paved the way so we could follow his example and love our spouse the way that Jesus loved us. And so we look at the whole passage, it all ties together. And he goes on to uh, Matthew 5, I'm sorry, Ephesians 5.21 and it says this. And further, so in addition to, so what I've said has been great. Now I'm going to even do a little emerald and kick it up a notch, right? <laughs> Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wow. He, so he's talking about to the spouse, the husband and the wife, to submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. What, is, what does mutual submission mean? It simply means in your relationship, you go to your spouse and you say, you are the priority in my life. Right? And your spouse says, no, 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 no. You are the priority in my life. And the only argument you get is fighting over who's going to be the priority. Right? Because you guys are working hard to submit to each other. And it's powerful. You know, we haven't seen a whole lot of that, have we? But when you have seen it, you recognize it. There's something beautiful about it. You envy it and you want it because that's the way God created it to be. It takes guts to get to that point. It's hard to get to that point, but it's worth it. Oh, it's so worth it. Mutual, mutual submission means you place yourself under the other person. Not because you're less important or not because you're less valuable, but because you want to love and submit to the other person. It's a decision. It's a choice. And Jesus is saying, I want you to love each other the way that I have loved you. Right? He's saying, I don't want you to take your cue from culture. I don't want you to take your cue from People Magazine at the CVS checkout line. I want you to take your cue from me. Love your spouse the way that I have loved you. So submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. And so when we hear this definition of what marriage is supposed to be, it sounds, it doesn't sound like that. Remember that song back in the day? Oh baby, you, you got what I need. But you say, remember that song, right? Right? It sounds, it should be more like this. Oh, remember that song? Can you feel the love tonight? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we hear those songs. We're like, oh, marriage is awesome. Right? And, and it's like, it should be, oh, oh, I wish I felt the love again. Right? Like I did last month between 2 and 2.30. <laughs> right? is we have this definition of what love is, but it's not a contract, because when you sign a contract, and it can, as soon as the other person doesn't fill their end of the bargain, it's over, right? But I'm going to tell you a little secret. It doesn't matter who you marry, I don't care if it's Brad Pitt, nobody is going to fulfill their end of the bargain 100%, because we're flawed, sinful people in progress, Right? And God is molding us and shaping us, but they're still going to fail. That's why you, God calls you to make a covenant that is not to be broken. And it's so funny because it goes on to say in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, it's almost like Paul could kind of probably just guess that as he's sharing about submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ, that people are going to be elbowing their spouse and not thinking it's them, but it's the other person sitting over there, right? And so he goes and he begins to bring specific application to both the husband and the wife so that nobody gets out, right? So nobody can skirt out. And I love also that, that passage that says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It gives you the definition of why we're supposed to put the other person first. Is it because the other person deserves it? Is it because the other person has enough points that you should treat them well? No, it's out of reverence for who? Christ. 
That's the whole reason why you're called to serve your spouse is not because they deserve it, but because your God gave you that love and now he asked you to do it the same. But here's the amazing thing. When you begin to make that a priority in your marriage, you say, God, I'm going to commit in a covenant between you and my spouse to love them the way that you love me. You will begin to see your marriage moving forward, even though it takes all the guts that you have inside of you. Because marriage is a covenant, not a contract. Ephesians 5 verse 22 goes on to say, For wives, that means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And he's saying it again because we have this natural inclination to say, well, I'm not going to put them first. I'm not going to serve them because, you know, they didn't flush the toilet and they, you know, didn't put this away. And the toothpaste thing is all squeezed up all over the place. And it's just a, the bed wasn't made and the list goes on and on and on. And I'm not going to do that. And God says, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his, bo of, of his body, the church, as the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands and everything. And so at this time, probably all the guys were going, Amen, Paul, preach it, brother. That's what I'm talking about. You're getting their hankies out and they're waving it, right? And, uh, and then, then Paul says, well, hold on. Hold on a minute. He says, and for husbands... This means love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wow. Wow. So when you read both those, those things, it's like basically we're called to enter into a covenant with God at marriage to lay down our lives for our spouse. That means when they are being a jerk, that you still lay down your life for your spouse. That means when they're not fulfilling your end of the bargain, you lay down your life for your spouse the way that you're your Savior did for you. That's tough, isn't it? Yeah. Now you know why we have Reconnect Marriage Retreat. <laughs> right? It's, like, it's, it's, it's a battle. But I'm telling you what, if you will change your theological understanding of marriage from a contract to a covenant, you won't regret it. It is one of the hardest things you would do and take all the guts guys that you have inside of you. But I'm telling you what, you can do it and it's worth it. A marriage is a covenant, not a contract. I'm going to show you a video. Uh, just, I'm only going to show you 2 minutes and 27 seconds of it. And I'm going to post the rest of the video on my blog because it's a 10 minute video. But I thought this was a great visual of what marriage and love is. It's more than a feeling. It's more than emotion. But it's a, it's a covenant between God and your spouse. And Ian and Marissa were dating and they were in love. And they dated for about 10 months when Ian got in a car, uh, um, got in an accident and had a traumatic brain injury. And when that happened, you know, she knew that Ian was ring shopping. And so she said, you know, I want to, I want to be by his side. I want to be taking care of him. And, and, you know, as he continued to try to recover, she said, you know, if he will learn to communicate again, then I'll consider marrying him and following through. And sure enough, he learned how to communicate. He learned um, how to talk and they ended up getting, ma uh, getting married. And when you watch this video, it's hard to fight back the tears even if you're a guy because you look at that and you say, that's God. That is God in action. God's presence, His Spirit, His working. You say, I want that involved in my marriage. That's the kind of love that God, your, your, your Heavenly Father, wants to develop in you. A love that and a marriage that has Christ at the center of the marriage. And to where you as a husband say, you know what? I'm going to love my, my wife even if she doesn't acknowledge me or appreciate me the way that I, that I deserve. I'm going to set the example as a spiritual leader in my home and I'm going to continue to move forward. It's where, it's where the, the wife says, you know, I'm going to submit to my, my husband, not because, you know, I understand that that word in this culture is like very intimidating and, and women rise up and say, I'm not submitting to anybody, you know, this is, you know, but it, it's like, you know, where the wife says, you know, I'm here to help you succeed, baby. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to be your number one cheerleader. I'm here to love you and to serve you. And even if there are times that you're a jerk and you're just a, uh, you know, a, a guy, <laughs> that's all you can say. You know, I'm going to love you anyways. When, when you make that kind of commitment, and listen, nobody can make that commitment for you. You have to change your theological understanding of marriage. It's not a contract. When you get married and at the altar, you are standing before God and you say, you know, I will, to love and to cherish, 
in sickness and in health, for richer, for poor, to death do us part. And you're inviting God to be in the center of that marriage. I'm telling you, you guys can do it. It's very hard, but you can do it. A covenant, not a contract. And regardless of your past or how many divorces you may or have, God wants your current marriage to succeed. He wants you to be in it for the long haul. He wants your marriage to be alive and growing, even through all the chaos. And teens, if there's any teenagers here this morning, I want to encourage you to go online, either watch or listen to this message again. Get this in your, in your heart, teenagers. If you want to make it for the long haul, if you want to celebrate a 50-year anniversary, then know right off the bat, teenagers, that marriage is not a contract where it's going to be fair. It's a covenant. And when you find that person that you fall in love with, remember, it's easy to fall in love and get married. It's not so easy to stay in love and to stay married. But if you have the theological foundation in the beginning, that it's, a con it's not a contract, it's a covenant, you can make it. You can make it together. You can weather the storm and you can begin to love and make a conscious choice that you're going to love your spouse the way that Jesus loved you. Man, it's so worth it. You know what? I don't know if I've ever seen anybody at the end of their life in the deathbed in the hospital say, I really regret obeying God's word. I really wish I would have done it my own way. Usually it's the other way around. You say, man, if I could go back, I would have trusted God and took him at his word. And really, guys, if I can just strip it all down to the very core, it's a matter of trust in our Heavenly Father. God, this is what you have for me. You know, I think the two biggest areas that we struggle trusting God in is number one, tithing our finances. And number two, in marriage. But, 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 and all of the reasons why. Let's trust our Heavenly Father. Let's begin to change our thinking when it comes to what marriage is. And let's begin to build strong and healthy marriages little by little in the marathon race. So if you can bow your heads and close your eyes. As we wrap up this gathering, marriage is a covenant, not a contract. And maybe you're here this morning and you've never crossed the line to relationship with Jesus. Well, the cool thing is that you heard in the video and you heard me say is that Jesus Christ loved us the way that we wish we could be loved by others. Is that he didn't wait for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. He didn't wait for us to, to impress him. But he left his throne in heaven and came and walked this earth and died on the cross for our sins. So we could have access to relationship with God again. And if you've never begun a relationship with God, please, I want to pray in this moment and open up your heart and say, and pray with me inside your heart. And God knows your heart and he'll respond to you right where you're at. So, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus into this world. And even though I sinned, I thank you, Jesus, that you took my sin upon yourself. And I am putting my faith and my trust in you for salvation in this moment. God, I want you to God, cleanse me from my sins. God, make me new. And I want to have a relationship with you. God, I want to know that love, God, personally in my heart. And I want to begin to walk with you personally from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And with no one looking around, if, if, if you can say, Jeremy, I prayed that prayer for the first time this morning to cross the line to a relationship with Jesus. So you can simply just raise your hand or a finger. Just get my attention really quick. Say, yeah, Jeremy, I prayed that prayer. Is there anybody here this morning? Awesome. You go ahead and, and look up. So here's my challenge, my takeaway for you guys this morning. And then Pastor Evans is going to close the gathering. Is regardless of how long you've been married, here's your challenge. Um, each couple is going to get a take home page on the way out. We have one per couple. And uh, I want you to spend time together praying this week and renewing your covenant with your, with your spouse this week. And basically what you're going to see in the take home page is there's going to be the, the traditional wedding vows. But then we added some verbiage to it as well to make it a little bit more real, right? Because when you're, when you're standing there on your wedding day and you're holding hands and you're saying, in sickness and in health, you're really not thinking of, of sickness. You're thinking how beautiful you're, you're, or how, how handsome your spouse is, right? 
and uh, you have all the, you know, the, the tingly feelings and how emotional it is, and then, and then you get to actually sickness and in health, right? And then you get to richer for poorer, and then you get to all the things. And so I'm, I want to challenge you to kind of find a time with your spouse this week and have a time of prayer and, and go through that take-home sheet together and, uh, and recommit your, your relationship there. If you're, if you're currently not married, I want to encourage you um, this week, every day, if you're not married, read Ephesians chapter 5. Just once a day. Read the whole chapter. And let God begin to rechange your view of what love is and what marriage is. Okay? Thank you. You guys have been so awesome. I'm going to pray for you and then Pastor Evan is going to dismiss. Father God, I thank you so much for everybody that's in this auditorium this morning. God, I, God, I love them, but God, my love, God, pales in comparison to your love. God, you believe in their marriage. You want their marriage to succeed. God, you are for them. And God, I just pray that we would begin to cultivate, Lord God, in this place, in our congregation, Lord, I pray, Lord, marriages that are moving forward and not backwards. Marriages that are going to be making it, God, and not failing. God, I know that you are able. God, I know what the statistics are. I know that it's difficult, but I know, God, that there's men and women in this room that want something different. They don't want average. They don't want statistics, God. They want to do everything the way that you've called them to do. So I pray, God, in your powerful name that you begin to change our thinking for marriage. God, help us let go of the contract thinking and help us begin to live out the covenant, God, of loving our spouse the way that you have loved us. God, we need you, and we're, we're banking on your power and your strength and your grace. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastor Evan? All right. I think sometimes when we think about love, we almost think of like an exchange. So I give them this, and they give me that, right? It's like if I'm nice to my wife, she'll be nice to me back. If, if, uh, if I make her food, she'll rub my back or whatever. Like you think of love as an exchange, right? But it's interesting because when you look at scripture, it actually has different types of love that are mentioned. And, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the types of love that are mentioned deal with that sort of exchange. But really, the type of love that God has for us is called agape love, which is unconditional regardless of what we get, regardless of what he gets in return, God loves us, you know? And so it kind of gives an entirely new perspective when you think of that verse. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children and live a life of love just as Christ loved us, right? Regardless of what we do back and forth. And that's the sort of love that we're supposed to give to our wife, to our spouse, that same type of love. And so uh, let's be imitators of that this morning. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, if this is your first or second time here, I want to encourage you to fill out your communication card. And drop it over off at the Welcome Center. We have a special gift for you, a great gift for you. If you're first or second time guest, stop there. Or maybe you've been here multiple times before, still fill out the communication card. Drop it off at the Welcome Center. Um, we have a drawing every month, and you could win something really cool. So that's pretty exciting. And then uh, also you're probably sitting on one of our offering envelopes. We, um, we appreciate your giving. You can give online or you can uh, give right here. Actually, the, the, um, the offering bucket is in the back. We actually don't pass a, a, a bucket, but we, we do have one in the back. We appreciate your giving. And then um, if you need any prayer this morning, if you have any needs, make sure you take advantage of the prayer team. So that being said, I'm just going to uh, close in prayer and you guys can be dismissed. God, we thank you for who you are this morning. We thank you that your love for us is unconditional. We thank you that um, it is not a contract that we sign. It's not some kind of thing that, that requires specific things for us to do, but that it's unconditional love, God. And we just pray that you'll guide and direct our marriages. We pray that you'll guide and direct our relationships. We pray that you will encourage us and uh, use us this week in your holy name. Amen.